Okay, at the outset, I want to uh, apologize to the people from the um, Center for Applied Energy Research in, in Lexington. The talk that I gave there about in early February isn't too dissimilar from this one. So you can uh, take this opportunity to think about something else or catch up on some sleep. I just haven't had enough time to modify this too much. Um, the title there, the uh, catalytic hydrogen treatment of toxic chlorinated gas streams. Okay, by hydrogen treatment, I really mean hydrogenolysis. So there is a, a decided link with the topic that was covered in the, very well in the first talk. Um, and by hydrogenolysis, I really mean hydrodechlorination. So we use hydrogen to selectively um, cleave a chlorine to carbon bond and generate HCl as the product. Um, I took up an appointment at the Department of Chemical Materials Engineering at UK in October. Most of the material I'm going to present today was, was conducted in my previous uh, um, university, University of Leeds in England. So. 99% of this, the uh, results I'm going to present here were generated there, but I'm trying to carry this work on at UK. So catalytic hydrodechlorination. Okay, the, uh, in terms of application, this is a decided environmental dimension. Uh, the sort of feedstock we're looking at are chlorinated aromatics, uh, typically mono and polychlorinated benzenes, toluenes, phenols, all materials that appear on the so-called blacklist, they're high priority environmental toxins. So I'm presenting hydrodechlorination just in this, this overhead and get onto some, some um, results pretty quickly. I'm presenting hydrodechlorination as an environmental remediation methodology, if you like, whereby you can selectively cleave one or more chlorines from a, say, polychlorinated aromatic but in a very concentrated stream, whether that be gas or liquid. If you look at the alternative approaches, there are three listed here, and these are three established approaches. Adsorption, solvent extraction, some sort of physical separation, whereby you're really just concentrating um, what would be regarded as chlorinated waste, with no chemical transformation and no real possibility of recycle. Biodegradation, could certainly regard that as a little bit more progressive. But most of the chlorinated aromatics that I'll be looking at are um, the starting material for preparing herbicides and insecticides. So they're uh, quite toxic to most uh, microorganism agents. So biodegradation, where it's possible, occurs at very, very low reaction rates. So if you could build a reactor, a bioreactor, it would have to be really oversized and and um, costly to, to, to use. Incineration is probably the preferred method. And it is a robust technology, and you can certainly break down the um, any chlorinated uh, stream to CO2 and HCl. Okay, you're generating unwanted carbon dioxide. If there is any partial oxidation, you're going to generate a product that's even more toxic than the initial feedstock. And in any case, it's not the best use of resources. And here it's completely destructive, and there's no possibility of recycle. So hydrodechlorination, it's certainly non-destructive. Recycle is a definite option. And there are two possible strategies here with recycle. If we were to take, say, a highly chlorinated material, say pentachlorophenol, you could attempt to remove all the chlorines to generate uh, raw material phenol, which would be re-diverted back to your process. Or you could selectively remove one or more chlorines to generate a, a desired chloroisomer. The problem here is that with chlorination, it's notoriously non-selective, and there's always a, a decided significant amount of overly chlorinated um, isomers that would be regarded as waste. So that quickly sets chlorination, hydrodechlorination within an application's context. Okay, I won't belabor this slide. The sort of catalysts that we've been looking at, uh, standard hydrogenolysis uh, catalysts, nickel, platinum, palladium based, um, I've been uh, solely looking at supported systems. 
on silica alumina amorphous materials or, or crystalline zeolites. Each of the variables here has a decided impact on activity and selectivity. Whether the metal and each of these metals and the loading of each of these metals certainly influences catalytic efficiency. The method of preparation we found has a significant effect. How you then treat the, the catalyst precursor and how you activate the final precursor also has a, a decided effect on the nature of the active catalyst and its performance. I'll limit the um, material today to nickel on silica um, used for gas phase operation, um, but at certain points I'll just refer to palladium, which is a system we're looking at now in more detail, palladium on alumina and palladium on silica, um, in both liquid and gas phase. But all the results will, will refer to gas phase nickel silica operation. Just a very quick schematic here of the sort of setup for the gas phase operation. Uh, hydrodechlorination can, can certainly run to pretty reasonable catalytic efficiencies under atmospheric pressure. It's a standard microreactor, um, a fixed bed plug flow type system. Hydrogen can be uh, diluted with helium to look at partial pressure effects. The, uh, the uh, chlorinated aromatics will be fed as liquids, vaporized, carried through the catalyst in a hydrogen, solely hydrogen or a hydrogen helium mix. For online analysis or for trapping, for um, interval type analysis, the, the uh, predominant variables we've looked at here would be hydrogen partial pressure, contact time, temperature, feed rate of chloroaromatic. They're the, more or less the variables that we really um, focused on. And of course, the nature of what's in this catalyst bed. The one feature of this sort of setup that I just want to point out is that you're dealing with very toxic and um, corrosive materials. So the materials of construction of the, bed, of the catalytic reactor or whatever the chlorinated feedstock is going to come into contact with have to be very inert and we ran into some problems in that respect. Now some results. Uh, first of all, a qualitative Table. Okay, so the nickel silica catalyst, uh, for a low loaded nickel silica catalyst, these are the sort of temperature, this is the sort of temperature range we've been looking at, 200 to 300 centigrade. The only thing to take from this table is that for every reactant, whether it's a monochlorinated benzene or chlorophenol, or we go to dichloro, trichloro, pent pentachlorophenol, in every case, the product is solely the product of hydrodechlorination. Chlorobenzene goes to benzene over nickel silica. It, it isn't further hydrogenated to cyclohexene or cyclohexane. Likewise, phenol is not further hydrogenated to cyclohexanone or cyclohexanol. With the polychlorinated feedstocks, you get partially de partial dechlorination and total dechlorination. The only inorganic product is HCl. No chlorine is produced. This is true of nickel silica operating in the gas phase over these temperatures. We, we haven't really gone above 300 degrees because you're getting outside a really observing catalytic phenomena. Palladium catalysts are far more reactive and in the palladium system in both liquid and gas phase, benzene will further undergo a reaction to give cyclohexane. The phenols will undergo further hydrogenation to give um, Cyclo cyclohexanone, cyclohexanol. But the, the really positive feature of the nickel catalyst is that the temperature of operation isn't too extreme, and you have 100% selectivity in terms of hydrodechlorination. So there's no ring hydrogenation. Additionally, there's no um, hydroxyl group <coughs> cleavage either. The hydroxyl group remains intact on the ring. Now, to complement that, Table. Here's a table with some reaction rates uh, obtained at uh, 548 Kelvin. So the, the reaction rate here in every instance re refers to the rate of one chlorine removal. Chlorobenzene to benzene, a chlorophenol to a phenol. 
a dichlorophenol to um, a dichlorobenzene and dichlorophenol to a chlorobenzene or chlorophenol. If we take chlorobenzene, say, to be the base case, we'll see that the rate of dechlorination is much higher from uh, chlorophenol feedstock and from chlorotoluene feedstock. So the presence of an OH group or a CH3 group raises the rate of dechlorination. So the presence of an electron donating substituent enhances hydrodechlorination from the benzene ring just by comparing these three, these three um, sets of data here. If you include a second chlorine, which would be electron withdrawing, the rate of reaction is much lower. So if you like, from, from the standpoint of organic chemistry, this would suggest that the reaction is electrophilic. That sort of, of um, labeling might not uh, hold too well for, for uh, gas phase hydro catalytic hydrodechlorination, but one thing we can certainly say is that you ha if you have an ele electron donating substituent, you do ra raise the rate of hydrodechlorination. If you have an electron withdrawing substituent, you do lower the rate of dechlorination. Hydrodebromination, going from bromobenzene to benzene, again it's fully selective. HBr is the only inorganic product, but the rate is considerably lower. So we could say that bromine certainly is not as well activated by the nickel catalyst under these conditions. And there's very little literature available on, on removing bromine in the presence of hydrogen or hydrogenolysis of bromine systems. So we heard in the first talk that um, catalyst lifetime is, is certainly important in, in hydrogenolysis systems. And one um, attractive feature of hydrochlorination is not only it's this, the environmental application, but because chlorine is so electron withdrawing, just looking at the interaction of something like chlorine with a supported metal is certainly of academic interest to see how chlorine can interact with the, with the catalyst and what effects does it have? What sort of impact does a chlorine interaction on a supported metal system uh, cause? So here we're plotting the effect of the total amount of chlorobenzene. So we're looking at hydrodechlorination of chlorobenzene that have been hydroprocessed on the, on the rate of reaction. So the x-axis here is the total concentration of chlorine that the catalyst had come in contact with. This is a rate ratio. R0 is the initial rate of hydrodechlorination. RCL is the rate of hydrodechlorination at some time on stream, or it will, it will definitely uh, refer to some amount of chlorine that has been passed over the catalyst. If we look at the extreme of the x-axis here, this represents something like 800 hours on stream, a constant operation. We have two um, nickel silica catalysts, low loaded, the, the uh, blue squares, higher loaded, uh, the green triangles. Uh, there is a scatter of data here, um, but one can at least say that the, the lower loaded nickel catalyst does retain its activity more or less, albeit, albeit there is a scatter. The higher loaded system declines significantly with time, but even after 800 hours on stream, which does represent a, a high chlorine to nickel ratio, it's only lost about 70% of its initial activity. So the, the lower loaded catalyst more or less resistant poisoning, we could say, or in terms of catalytic, of catalytic activity, it's, it's maintained. The higher loaded catalyst loses it, its activity. So we started characterizing this system, the higher nickel loaded catalyst, to see what's causing this, this loss of activity. I'm only going to present some, some of the um, characterization data here. Hydrogen TPD showed one clear cut effect. Here we see the hydrogen TPD data for this higher loaded nickel catalyst, the one that had deactivated. The uh, blue profile is the fresh catalyst. The uh, green profile is the used catalyst, again after 800 hours on stream where it had lost um, roughly 70% of its activity. And you'll see that the, the profile has been shifted about a 50 degree differential. So the hydrogen is more strongly held on the used catalyst. At the very least, you can see here that the TPD uh, profiles have, been, have certainly been disrupted. This wasn't the case for the lower loaded catalyst, where the fresh catalyst and used catalyst profiles more or less overlapped. So one effect of the chlorine interaction is to disrupt the hydrogen TPD to stabilize the hydrogen on the surface, which, is, which 
obviously had a negative effect on the hydrochlorination activity. So that's one aspect. Um, sintering was another effect of hydrogen or chlorine nickel interaction. Now these, uh, I've never been able to get good overheads of um, TEMs. They always look like, like frog spawn, and that's what this one looks like. But this is a freshly activated 15% nickel catalyst. This is the used one, and at least you can see, given that it's not too clear, you do see a growth in, the, in nickel particles, or certainly a sintering, if we take this to be representative of the freshly activated um, dispersion of the nickel. You do certainly get a growth of, of nickel particles, and that's more than likely the result of the formation of some volatile nickel chloride species on, on the surface. Um, HCl is our, is our um, inorganic product, so we thought that let's, if HCl is interacting with the nickel and causing it to grow, let's contact the, the freshly activated catalyst directly with HCl gas and see how that affects the catalyst. And here's a um, TEM of, a, of the resultant catalyst, our nickel and silica directly interact, directly contact with HCl, and you get this very faceted nickel particles um, come quite different from, from the uh, used catalysts, but there's a definite growth and a definite faceting of the, of the particles. So contacting the catalyst directly with HCl is far more extreme than this indirect contact, um, which is the result of the product of the hydrodechlorination. Those sort of, of um, dispersions, metal dispersions, are probably better shown in the histogram here which takes those three samples and gives a particle size distribution of each. So the blue bars are our fresh catalyst. There's the, um, the label here. Reasonable, at least symmetrical dispersion. Average particle size is somewhere about two nanometers. The yellow bars are our um, deactivated catalyst a definite shift in particle size to an average of somewhere about four. The direct HCl contact has had a completely different effect, an extremely severe broadening of the particle sizes and, and a complete shift of range of particle sizes. One other aspect of the HCl treatment, and I'll just cut up one um, transparency that shows this. When we took this catalyst and used it to hydrodechlorinate chlorobenzene. Firstly, it showed very, very low activity, just trace conversions. But one thing we did see on this catalyst, when we looked at it under the electron microscope, was that there was a, a growth of carbon from this HCl-treated catalyst. Here's, our, here's a low magnification image, a higher magnification image. Again, the quality isn't great, but I, I hope you can see that this is a catalyst particle. These um, needle-like growths that you see coming from the catalyst particle are actually graphitic carbon filaments. You can see them perhaps better under the high magnification. So this is the direct result of contacting the catalyst with HCl, then using that HCl-treated catalyst to convert chlorobenzene. We hardly got any, any benzene formed, but we did get a significant conversion of the chlorobenzene, but that was converted to carbon, and a graphitic form of carbon. We, did, we never saw this with standard catalysts. We certainly did see a, a, an appreciable amorphous carbon content, but nothing, no evidence of this sort of carbon growth. And just to illustrate the nature of that carbon growth, here's a TEM of a individual filament. Uh, this is from this was this was taken from a HBr treatment. HBr HCl had the same effect on the catalyst. Um, you can see the graphitic um, lattice fringe structure on the on the carbon, and this was this was produced at somewhere about 250 degrees, in very very low temperatures compared to um, what is even even though there isn't a standard way of producing graphitic carbon filaments. By catalysis, the temperature here is certainly lower than the typical 600 degrees, 700 degrees that's, that's put in the literature. But this is an aside to the main um, 
topic that I want to present here. But this is something we are following up now actively, seeing how can we can we make use of this um, seemingly um, promoted system that has shifted the emphasis from hydrodechlorination to a complete breakdown of the chlorobenzene into um, a graphitic carbon product. But back back to the um, to the hydrodechlorination data. I showed previously that the higher nickel loaded catalyst was more prone to deactivation. That's unfortunate because hydrodechlorination appears to be a structure sensitive um, reaction. Here we're plotting hydrodechlorination rate as a function of nickel particle size for the conversion of two feedstocks, two chlorophenol and chlorobenzene. In both cases, the specific rate constant, which is rate constant that's directly related to the surface area of the nickel increases significantly with increasing particle size. And this increase in particle size is directly linked to increased metal loading. So it's unfortunate that our higher nickel loaded catalysts, which are represented here, sinter, and the hydrogen TPD is disrupted, and there is a carbon deposit because what we're plotting here are initial rate constants, and the initial rate constants for the higher loaded catalysts are much higher, but unfortunately these are more prone to deactivation. So that's something that, that we're still trying to, to resolve, to, to try to optimize the system. That's it for the limited characterization data I'm presenting. Here's a, a typical reaction scheme. The uh, the feedstock here is a 2,4-dichlorophenol. The numbers here associated with each of the arrows or each of the steps are pseudo-first order rate constants. So you see the, the conversion of this one dichloroisomer goes through two partially dechlorinated um, chlorophenol reactive intermediates because they undergo hydrodechlorination to give you the phenol. So to go from our dichlorophenol to a phenol, it goes through stepwise via two possible chlorophenol isomers, or goes in a concerted one step total dechlorination to phenol. There are a couple of features here I want to point out. From the range of chloroisomers we've looked at, in general, the chlorine that's attached ortho to the OH group is much more difficult to remove. Than, than any chlorine that's further separated from this hydroxyl group. So steric hindrance has a big role to play in, in terms of the reaction scheme and in terms of the um, selectivity and reaction rate. Isomeric structure in general plays a big role in, in selectivity and activity. That takes me back to these two goals that were identified. So you can approach hydrodechlorination in two ways. You either want to take your, your um, polychlorinated feedstock, remove all the chlorines, and get you to the parent aromatic. So this is what we're looking at here. The yield of benzene from two different trichlorobenzene isomers. One to three trichlorobenzene, where each chlorine is located on adjacent carbons, or the one, three, five trichlorobenzene which is a very symmetrical isomer where each chlorine is spaced as far apart as it can be. The x-axis here is essentially contact time. And as you would expect, um, as you increase the contact time, you'll increase the yield of benzene or the selectivity which, with which total dechlorination proceeds. But this is strongly dependent on the nature of the isomer. It's much easier to remove all three chlorines when they're side by side than when the chlorines are spaced apart. Uh, here we're, we're showing a, a, a maximum of a 20, I mean, roughly 22% benzene yield, but the contact time here can be extended quite easily experimentally to, to take this up at least to about 80 or 90%. This is a single pass, so to get total um, chlorine removal and 100% benzene yield, just the incorporation of, of a recycle loop with, H, with a HCl trap, it's, it's quite easy and, it, and you do get complete chlorine removal. 
But again, the reaction conditions depend strongly on the nature of, of the isomer. So that goal is, can be readily achieved with a nickel uh, supported system. The alternative goal where you're looking for some degree of selectivity is not so easy. Taking an example here, um, a particular dichlorobenzene isomer, 1,4-dichlorobenzene. If, if we wanted to optimize the yield of chlorobenzene from this isomer, so the removal of one chlorine alone to give a partially dechlorinated product, <coughs> depending on the, on the loading of the nickel catalyst, there's an optimum. The higher loaded nickel catalyst is much more reactive, so the optimum contact time is lower than the lower loaded, less active catalyst. But in any case, the optimum yield is, is, is low. So the nickel catalysts, and we've looked at a range of different isomers, a range of different reaction conditions. This goal is not really achievable with a nickel system. But working with palladium systems now, we're certainly achieving higher um, yields, again under optimum, a particular set of optimum conditions, but it's very tricky no matter what to optimize partial removal of one or more chlorines to get one particular target isomer. Now that, all the data there is based on pseudo first order kinetics, looking at the um, reactor in integral mode. Um, very useful information for reactor design, but not so useful if you want to look at some, some mechanistic um, considerations. So I'm going to put up and finish off some um, of the more detailed mechanistic kinetics we've been looking at, but this is going to be really a brief coverage. Uh, we've limited to the typical langmuir hinchelwood uh, kinetic model. These are the sort of uh, considerations we've taken into account. Whether or not the absorption of the chloral aromatic or the hydrogen is competitive or non-competitive, whether the overall reaction is absorption, desorption limited, or whether it operates purely under surface control, whether the adsorption of the reactive form of hydrogen or chlorobenzene, or sorry, chloroaromatic, is dissociative or associative, and taking some um, recognition of HCl inhibition, our chlor inorganic chlorine product. And finally, we're working on, uh, we're using supported catalysts, supported nickel catalysts, which can't be considered as a as uniform surface. So some correction for non-uniformity of the surface. Now I'm going to just jump straight to our final kinetic model, the refined model. Now the equilibrium adsorption constants here are all composite values, so they're made up of a number of, of um, contributing factors, likewise the rate constant. The um, critical feature of this model is, and this model best fits the uh, experimental data over the range of conditions we've studied. Non-competitive adsorption and a non-uniform surface, that's one aspect of this model. Dissociative adsorption of both hydrogen and chlorobenzene, and the reactive form of hydrogen is a spillover species. This we've also shown through additional reactions by mixing standard sort of tests for spillover involvement, mixing the, the supported catalyst with uh, support, um, where you get a, an additional reservoir of spillover hydrogen, and that certainly did raise the, the overall hydrodechlorination activity. Now, I just want to present one plot of um, rate versus Rate here is plotted as a function of partial pressure of chlorobenzene. So this is a chlorobenzene hydrodechlorination. Uh, the uh, symbols represent uh, experimental data. The lines represent the, the kinetic model. Um, what we're varying here is the, is the um, partial pressure of hydrogen. So we run the gamut of um, partial pressure chlorobenzene of uh, five-fold difference 
the partial pressure of hydrogen about a threefold difference. This is typical of, of all the um, results we've got. This is just one representative um, plot that the, the model does coincide in every case, no matter how far we've been able experimentally to change the partial pressure of chlorobenzene or the partial pressure of hydrogen or the temperature or the loading of the, of the nickel catalyst. This model does certainly represent the data. We are now looking at, at um, dichloro and trichloro systems where you, you get within this range of partial pressure, you get an, an, a maximum. And the model is, is again um, reproducing that maximum, but that work is at an early stage. So with a maximum, it's more convincing. Here you just have this red steady increase in, in data. But all the other models that we attempted to fit, they all fell apart at some point, some critical <coughs> range of, of conditions. So I want to leave it at that. Just some conclusions. Um, for hydrodechlorination reaction, I've only presented data on, on uh, the gas phase system. Nickel silica catalysts are 100% selective in that you have no ring hydrogenation or ring substituent hydrogenolysis. HCl is the sole inorganic chlorine product. Very durable if you have a lower loaded nickel catalyst. But higher loadings, still durable given the high concentration of chlorine that the catalyst has been asked to um, process. The hydrochlorination reaction itself is stepwise if you have a polychlorinated uh, feedstock. Electrophilic in that an electron donating ring substituent <coughs> raises the rate of hydrochlorination. Structure sensitive in that higher um, nickel particle size raises the specific rate of, of hydrochlorination. If you want to optimize the process in terms of complete or partial uh, hydrochlorination, nickel loading is certainly one important variable. Contact time is the second one. Uh, kinetics, the pseudo-first order approach is very useful for, for design criteria. And the detailed model, which I, I admit I've glossed over here, spillover hydrogen seems to be a critical uh, reactive species. So I just want to acknowledge all the people who have been involved in this work. And we've moved on to bigger and better things. But, uh, Four here were grad students. Uh, Colin is still in England, still working on the, um, the hydrodechlorination reaction. These were the funding sources, all British-based, so I'm going to have to start finding a US-based sponsor. So that, that concludes the talk. I think I, I might have glossed over a few things, but thanks for your attention, and I'll answer any, any questions you've got. curious about your mechanism in which you invoke uh, spillover, but you didn't say in detail uh, hydrogen is spilling over from where to where. Presumably it's absorbing on the nickel? Yeah, it's certainly absorbing. And spilling over onto the silica? Spilling over onto the silica. Where it encounters? Or the interface. Uh -huh. And where, where is the chlorinated hydrocarbon being? The chloro chlorinated hydrocarbon can be absorbed on the metal or on the interface or on the silica. The problem with um, these chlorinated species is to do any spectroscopic work, which would give us some indication, it's difficult because of the corrosive nature of these um, chemicals. So it's, it's just an experimental problem that we have in, in our lab. But that would give some indication. So is the presumption that the, the silanol groups on silica react with the chlorinated hydrocarbon to release HCl and make an alkoxide? That's possible. That's a, that's a definite possibility, but certainly the HCl that's produced could definitely interacts with the with nickel also to form some form of nickel chloride species. Sure. Because we do get some leaching of nickel chloride into the solu into solution yeah. in, in liquid phase. And from a, a mapping of these of the used catalyst, what we've seen is, is um, appreciable chlorine just dispersed over the entire catalyst. So not, not segregated, say, around the metal, or not located on the, on the support alone, but it's just blanket coverage of the catalyst.
So, so what supports the idea that you have spill, a spillover effect? And a, a, a spillover effect nice. based on, on the, the development of this model, that's indirect. But taking, say, our nickel silica catalyst, um, diluting that with silica alone, mm -hmm. and looking at the specific hydrodechlorination rate based on the, on the uh, surface area of the nickel, um, this, diluting that with silica gives you a higher hydrodechlorination rate. So one of the, it's a crude test, but it's the one test that has been used for spillover. But there's one, one feature that we tentatively say now is that you have um, a particular type of hydrogen for hydrogenation on these catalysts, and you have a particular type of hydrogen for hydrodechlorination. And the two are, are quite distinct. And once you contact the catalyst with, with this chlorinated uh, aromatic, you completely destroy the source of, of hydrogenation hydrogen. So if we, if we take our fresh catalyst, one of these nickel catalysts, and pass benzene over it under certain conditions, we certainly get a lot of cyclohexane. If we take the same catalyst and pass some chlorobenzene over it for a very short period of time, then pass benzene over that, there's no conversion whatsoever. So we've been trying to link that to hydrogen TPD as well. It's all tentative, but I have to say that. Yes. Yeah, Mark Leo, Manager DuPont. We've spent a lot of effort over the years on hydrodechlorination of CFCs, quite different systems. Mm -hmm. Saw the same sort of thing, sintering of palladium primarily yeah. in those systems. But we're able to minimize that a lot by alloying things like uh, gold. Yeah. I wonder if you tried anything like that's, that in your system. That's the one thing we haven't looked at yet. We've been taking the simplest case, which would have been just a monometallic supported system. Well, we have been um, using things like uh, lithium and sodium as, as electron donating promoters, and we've seen a big effect there. But trying to ensure that the lithium and sodium doesn't coat the, um, the metal particles, that's been a bit of a problem. But it's definitely very electronic um, sensitive, this hydrodechlorination. So alloying would definitely have an effect. But there's very limited um, literature on chlorophenol hydrodechlorination or even chlorobenzene. So we're just starting at, I suppose, baseline present. Alloying, definitely. I was also surprised to see that carbon was not in your list of supports. Um, not yet. That's. We're hoping that this carbon, this filamentous carbon that we produced by accident, to at least go back and start using that at some point as a support for, for metal. There are, there is some literature, though, on carbon support. Yeah.